Hello and welcome to the I for Energy seminar uh, for spring 2013. We are very happy to have Janice Lynn with us today. I want to um, also welcome those who are watching via the webcast as well as those who are watching from the different campuses at Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz. And for those of you who might be watching this later on at, um, via YouTube. I've asked Ron Hoffman to introduce Janice, and without any further ado, I'm going to ask him to come up and give her a nice, warm welcome. So, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's my real pleasure to introduce Janice, um, who I've known for over 15 years, and, um, and it's been a wonderful association over all of those years. Uh, I feel that Janice is both my friend and my colleague. Uh, Janice and I got to know each other back in the mid-90s when Janice was working on a project in China for Generation Ventures, and so was I. And so from that day forth, I've had the joy of uh, knowing Janice. Um, since that time, Janice has become a recognized thought leader in uh, energy storage and renewables in the electricity sector. And I think today we are honored to have her here uh, to get her thoughts on what's going on with respect to storage. I should tell you that uh, Janice's background includes the starting of companies, so those of you that are entrepreneurial will appreciate Janice's background. She started Stratagen Consulting in 2005, which is a strategy consulting company uh, that works in clean energy. Um, in 2009, she started the California Energy Storage Alliance. She co-founded that with her partner. And... Um, CISA, as it is known, I believe now has close to 40 members or something in that. How many? 60 members, you see. It's viral. Um, prior to Stratagen, uh, Janice got involved in the uh, renewable sector about the turn of the century, and she worked for Powerlight and became the VP of business development there. Powerlight was eventually acquired by Sun Power, and a lot of the things that Janice worked on have become... Uh, recognized as uh, pioneering in the early days of commercial solar. Janice has a BS from Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and she also has an MBA from Stanford Graduate School. We won't hold that against her. Uh, today, Janice will talk about how energy storage is transforming the electric power system. Please uh, join me in welcoming her to UC. you guys hear me? It's working. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank Therese and Carl, um, folks at Citrus and CIE for the opportunity to come and speak to all of you today and the folks who are in the wider network. It's, it's really a pleasure to do this and I'm thrilled to be here. So I'm going to start with a story, but stay with me, okay? In 2006, you could not buy dental floss in China, anywhere, Beijing, Shanghai. How do I know this? Because I was on a business trip in China, and I forgot to bring my dental floss. And I looked and I looked, and I was a you know, pretty junior analyst working with this venture capital firm, and what are you going to do? There's five days on this trip. I've got to get some dental floss somewhere. Am I going to ask the partner? No, 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 bad idea. So I asked the next best person who was available, and that person was Ron Hoffman. <laughs> and that was actually 17 years ago, not 15 years ago. And um, over those 17 years, um, Ron has become a dear friend and um, a real mentor for me. And um, it's because of Ron that I got into renewable energy, uh, got into the electric power system. And if it weren't for his patient guidance, answering all my zillions of questions, and, and really advice all these years, I don't think I would be where I am today. Why am I telling you this? Because I assume there's a bunch of students out there, and when I was a student myself, nobody told me how important it was to have a mentor. Mentors really make a lot of difference. So I want to encourage all of you guys to be open to your dental floss moment, because that mentor might show up when you least expect it. And... Um, and to remember that uh, you, know, you have the power to change the world. Today, I truly have my dream job. I work with super smart people. I get to work on the issues I'm deeply passionate about. And I get to change the world. And I believe each and every one of you in this audience has that potential too. 
and I hope you find your passion, and I hope through maybe in the next 45 minutes, just maybe, one of your passions will become renewable energy and energy storage, and, and hopefully you'll see how there's so much opportunity here and how this game changer, this amazing asset class, energy storage, has the potential to change the electric power system and change the world. Okay? Okay, I thought this was an appropriate place to start. What we're talking about is underutilized assets. It's not a new idea. I mean, you guys probably know this better than me. Airbnb, car sharing, Zipcar, I mean, there's all these assets around that we can share. If an asset's not being utilized to its fullest extent, it's kind of a loss, it's a waste, right? And here The Economist is talking about the era we're getting into is the sharing economy. You can share everything. Your car, your truck, an extra room in the house. I even heard there's a startup that's now sharing kitchens where you can do like serve dinners for people um, through the internet. This is exactly what we have with the electric power system. We have this tremendous asset worth trillions of dollars. We spend in California alone probably five to seven billion every year keeping this asset up to date and functioning, yet we only use it about half the time. Our average load factor is about 50, 55%. What you see here is a chart that um, on the y-axis is our system load here in California. On the x-axis, these are the months of the year. And as you can see, the average, the average load's about 55%. And this little peak, which happens maybe a few hours of the year, this we are building our electric system generation, transmission, and distribution capacity to meet that point in time. Because electricity, unlike many other industries and many other assets, is an asset that needs to be used in real time. Supply must always equal demand. This, I would argue, represents huge opportunity. Another opportunity with optimizing that picture is improving the greenhouse gas emissions. So imagine if our electric power system was just purely fossil fuel units. The emissions profile of a combined cycle gas peaker, which is this blue line down here, is much less, these are CO2 emissions, tons per megawatt hour, than the brown line, which is the emissions from a peaker. A peaker is something that's used intermittently. It's only used a certain amount of the year. It's ramping up and down. It's less efficient. So imagine with energy storage, and here's the concept with energy storage, you can take energy from one period of time, say store it from this base load, much cleaner fossil fuel plant, to displace some of this stuff, this peaker generation, you will achieve a net savings. You'll achieve greater efficiency in the system overall and lower CO2 emissions. And the savings can be quite significant. The other point to make is that our system is not composed of just combined cycle gas peakers. We have other things in the system, especially things that are super clean, like solar and wind. And in California, particularly at nighttime, we have a lot of wind. So imagine using more wind to displace that peaking stuff, net GHG benefit. So what is energy storage? Um, this is often a point of confusion among a lot of people. Some folks, when you say storage, they immediately go to their pocket and they think about the battery in their cell phone, the battery in their laptop. Probably each and every one of us probably has touched at least three or four batteries today. If you drove here, you have a battery in your car. When we talk about storage on the grid, it's a very broad asset class, just as broad as, say, the asset class called generation. You know, there's nuclear, gas, um, biomass, renewable, solar, wind. Storage is the same way. There's chemical storage, um, for example, batteries, many different types of batteries, flow batteries, solid state batteries. There's mechanical storage, which is storing energy um, through some kind of mechanical, in this case it's a flywheel. There's bulk mechanical storage, compressed air. This is uh, compressing air in an underground cavern, uncompressing it for use at a later time. Thermal storage, which has been used for many, 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 many years, <laughs> dating back to the prairie times. Um, there's ice, chilled water, and molten salt, which is often combined with concentrating solar power. 
And finally, bulk gravitational storage, which can be accomplished through pumped hydro, or uh, more recently, there's some innovative technologies around using um, rocks and bringing rocks up a hill and bringing them back down a hill. So many, many different forms of storage. What's the beauty of storage is with that diversity, there's tremendous, tremendous diversity in the solutions, tremendous diversity in the, the ability of these solutions to perform different services on the grid. And many types of energy storage are very modular. Modular meaning, think Legos, building blocks. Some are small, some are bigger. And these building blocks mean, the building blocks and the diversity means that energy storage can be deployed in many, many parts of our grid today. So it has broad electric power system applicability. And what you see here, this is a chart from EPRI, shows how storage can be put, um, you know, use at the transmission level for ancillary services. For bulk storage, maybe shifting a lot of energy from one period to the next. Distributed storage sited at a substation. Commercial storage behind the meter at a commercial facility to help with power quality, reliability, peak shaving, possibly um, in a neighborhood as well. So there's many, many different applications. And with that, many different ways or business models of deploying storage on the grid. So one thing we often talk about um, with storage is this message to think about this asset class and what it can do, not in terms of unit cost, but really to look at the benefits that it can provide. And a simple comparison that everybody can understand, even if you're not a power system engineer, is that uh, let's look at a 50 megawatt conventional gas peaker plant on the left and say a hypothetical 50 megawatt energy storage system on the right. The first thing to point out is that this 50 megawatt gas plant, which is typically the asset used today for peaking, spinning, reserve, and ancillary services, has a maximum range of 40 megawatts. So these are today's state-of-the-art gas peakers. This unit can go from 50 to 10 megawatts, you know, reasonably well. This is what we're using to balance our grid. The energy storage device, on the other hand, this 50 megawatts represents 100 megawatts of range. Why? Because it can charge 50 megawatts and it can discharge 50 megawatts. That's two and a half times the range of service that can be delivered. Another thing to think about with energy storage is certain types of storage are very fast, much faster, in fact, than that companion or status quo alternative called the natural gas peaker. What you see here is an, a, um, the AGC signal from, say, the system operator. I think this data is from CAISO. And this dotted green line is the signal that CAISO sends out to its fleet of gas peakers saying, give me some regulation, give me some frequency regulation. The red line is the response of the generator. You can see it's kind of slow, takes a while to ramp up, and the net effect is it doesn't do the job quite that well. So the system ends up needing to overcompensate. It either buys too much or not enough, and it's constantly going back and forth. On the other hand, and this, this example on the right could be a fast battery, it could be a flywheel. The beauty of this is you look at this, system, this signal, this dotted green line, and you can't even see the red line because it matches it so perfectly. Storage systems can respond within cycles, can be exact. That's a lot more effective. And we'll go into why and what the benefits are in a minute. Okay. So finally, and this is the final key point that I'd like to impart with you about like why is energy storage this amazing new thing? This is an asset that can be utilized throughout the year. There are many different services that a single asset deployed at a particular location, operated in a particular way, can provide. Again, back to our peaker example. Utilization of a gas peaker on an annual basis, maybe about 4%. Energy storage, 99.7%. What is that storage device doing throughout the year? And this is uh, actually a model of real data. This was done, oops, wrong button. This data over here, I don't, my little red, okay, here we go. So this is a chart that shows the utilization of the storage device through the course of a year and the different services that it's providing that add up to the benefits it's delivering. So when you think about that, you got more range, a faster response, 
and more benefits. Storage is the better way to do things. It's not how we've been doing things, but it's the better way to do certain things, certain services that are needed on the grid today. So what that will do is if we had some storage throughout our electric power system, we can take that, that previously poorly utilized system and flatten our load curve. The goal is that we want to utilize the existing assets we have much more efficiency. Let's take that average load factor up from 50% to 75 or 80%. That's low-hanging fruit. Here are some examples of storage facilities that are being developed today. This is a flow battery, the inside look. What does one of these batteries look like? Flow battery, this was a 600 kW, six-hour unit that was installed in Southern California at an onion plant. It's operating today primarily to um, provide peak shaving services and greater reliability for this behind-the-meter industrial customer. This is a, um, a lithium-ion system, battery system. It's a megawatt, one hour in duration, installed and operated by Samsung, SDI, one of the leading battery manufacturers globally for the power electronics industry, uh, the electronics industry. And they're using this system at their factory to um, also provide load shifting, capture demand charges. And um, we would be remiss not to give you an example of bulk storage. This is an example of a closed loop pumped hydro system installed in Michigan. To give you an idea of the scale, this is 1,872 megawatts. They call it a, um, <laughs> I love it. It's a, uh, it's a giant, um, you know, a water battery, one, one of the world's biggest electric batteries. And uh, what it does is it stores a lot of water. When you need it, you pump it up. When you need that electricity later, you let the water fall through and, and generate electricity through a turbine. Okay, that's today. So that's what storage can do today, a framework for why it's powerful, how it can be used in the electric power system, and what storage is. But what I want to talk about with all of you is what can storage do in the future? You know, what does this, what, you know, where can we go from here? And how many of you in the audience are students? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, good. Great. So often when we think about the future, it is important to look back where we came from, to our roots to look at the values of where we came from, because sometimes that gives us a clue of where we need to go. And what better place to look on the future of the electric power system than the father of the electric power system himself, Mr. Thomas Edison. And I quote for you, and this is in a real quote um, about circa 1920. Edison says, and this is in a conversation, I love it, with Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone, right? These are the fathers of the great industrial revolution. And he says, when we learn how to store electricity, we will cease being apes ourselves. Until then, we are tailless orangutans. You see, we should utilize natural forces and thus get all of our power. Sunshine is a form of energy. And the winds and the tides are manifestations of energy. Do we use them? Oh, no. We burn up wood and coal as renters burn up the fence for fuel. We live like squatters, not as if we own the property. I love this part. He says, I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. So here we are almost a century later. We're still cranking through those oil and coal reserves, but it's not too late. And that's where all of you come in. Even for those of you who don't believe in global warming, there is an economic reason for doing this you know, put aside the global warming debate. And that is the cost of renewable energy versus traditional generators is just more cost effective. It's going to be more cost effective. It's getting there in certain parts of the world. Solar energy is the most cost effective form of electricity today. What we have on the left is a comparison. This, these are instant upfront costs, I believe in $2,009 of a solar solar PV system, system uh, single axis tracker. And this bottom line here is the uh, 
forecasted cost, I believe this is from the Energy Commission, California Energy Commission, of a um, conventional simple cycle gas turbine. And one of the interesting things you'll notice is that the, um, you know, the costs are converging. This doesn't even factor in the fuel cost. So when you think about it, as the capital cost of this comes down, this asset has free fuel. Meanwhile, on the right, this is an actual forecast from NITO, which is the Department of Energy of Japan. I believe the Department of Energy also contributed to this forecast in 2010 that showed, and this is, again, it's an example. It's one type of energy storage. It's lithium ion, which is commonly used for consumer electronics and electric vehicles. And it shows the, cap the capital expenditure of a cost of lithium ion per kilowatt hour in 2012 dollars and what's happening by 2020. There's some pretty massive cost reductions. So when you put these trends together, renewable energy, getting cheaper. Storage, getting cheaper. Fossil fuel sources, getting more expensive. You do the math. This is the future. This is where we need to go. About a month ago, um, Angelina Galitova, who's a wonderful person, she's, one of, the, uh, she's on the, one of the board members of the California Independent System Operator. She is also the co-founder of an organization called Renewables 100. And it's a nonprofit whose mission is to look at ways we can achieve the pathway to 100% renewable energy. And Angelina asked me, she said, Janice, what are the ways, how can energy storage help enable a pathway to 100% renewable energy? I said, oh, I'd love to talk about that. So these are some slides from her conference two weeks ago. Who has seen this chart? This is the famous duck chart. Anybody familiar with this? We got one, two, two people, three. Um, this famous duck chart was presented by the California Independent System Operator at an en banc, so a, a meeting where they got together with the PUC and the legislature, and, um, and they, they were talking about sort of California's capacity needs going into the future. And CAISO came and they presented this, and they said, this is, this is our concern. What we have here is, here's again the ANTIS forecasted load of California over the course of a day, zero to 24 hours, so 24 hours in one day. And what this is a forecast of the net load starting with 2012, and these subsequent lines in color show the forecast through to 2020. And this is what they say is a typical March day at hourly resolution. And what CAISO presented at this conference was that our net load shape is changing dramatically here in California. And flexibility is needed sooner than later, maybe as soon as 2015. And the reason the duck's crying here is because um, CAISO, who has to balance the grid, has to deal with this tremendous ramp and this potential issue of overgeneration. Now, as a renewable advocate, we love the fact that this looks like a duck because what this big duck belly means here is that that's a lot of solar generation and renewable generation that's happening in the middle of the day. That's good. That's where we want to go. But the reason it's crying is it creates kind of a challenge for the systems operator. So how can energy storage help California achieve this vision and go even beyond that? Well, the first thing it can do Energy storage deployed throughout the grid can provide a load, can provide a place for all that extra renewable generation to go in the middle of the day. You know what we like to say? We say storage can put that duck on a diet and trim his belly, whoop, move it right up, take that renewable generation and shift it, move it to when you still need it, when there's still a system peak. And in this case, that's to flatten the duck's head. And that Remember that overall transmission chart? That's how we achieve greater system utilization. You get a flatter load shape, and that means the existing assets we have, generation, transmission, distribution, can be utilized more fully. So that, at a very high level, is how energy storage can enable a pathway to more and more uh, utilization of renewable energy. But this is at an hourly scale. And we all know that some forms of renewable energy are not so predictable. This is one of the great challenges for us as we look into the future. These charts have been presented in many other talks, but for those of you who haven't seen them, this is uh, one month's power from a wind farm. 
Um, I don't remember exactly which wind farm it is, but you can see it's pretty much all over the map. This Springerville, Arizona chart shows um, the production output of a solar system at uh, 10 second resolution on a cloudy day. So these, these um, incursions here, these white tips, those are the clouds coming across the solar system. These types of very significant dips in output from, you know, say four megawatts down to a megawatt, if you scale it up and there's a lot of this, this can be challenging for the system operator. So what happens is, you know, that smooth line that you saw at an hourly resolution, when you look at it sub-hourly or minute by minute or second to second, can be, you know, actually not that smooth. And these sort of minute to minute fluctuations, remember our fast response chart? This is something that storage is really, really good at. So here it is again. I like it so much, I'm going to show it to you one more time. And, uh, you know, these... That those issues, those you know, ramping and sort of minute to minute balancing issues, would you rather have this resource achieving that or that one? I say the one on the right is the better way to go. And here's an example. So it's not just talk, it's not just an idea. About, I want to say a month ago, a 36 megawatt battery was commissioned at a wind farm in Texas at a place called No Trees. It's called no trees because there really aren't any trees. And um, this particular battery system is provided, providing renewables capacity firming, that frequency regulation service that you, you saw. And um, it's, it's a, a really great project that we should be celebrating. This is not the only one. There's projects of this size and scope being impl implemented and deployed all over the world. Um, I think a couple months before that, there was uh, a couple of these installed in Chile, South America. So, what have we learned so far? One, that energy storage can drastically improve grid efficiency, improve existing asset utilization, and reduce GHG emissions. Two, we've learned that energy storage can provide multiple benefit streams from a single asset. Um, much more so than its status quo fossil fuel counterparts. And three, we've learned that energy storage can be instrumental in helping to integrate renewable energy and help us achieve a pathway to greater and greater renewable adoption. So what's the problem? Why, if it's so great, isn't there more energy storage installed on the grid today? You know, why? Think about it. Well, for starters, I want to say there is some. That's the good news. Some. And that's why the sum is in italics here. We have about, you know, I'll say anywhere from 140 to 150 uh, gigawatts of storage throughout the world. And by the way, that does not include energy storage used for UPS and emergency backup applications. We estimate globally that's probably about 60 to 65, mostly 60 to 65 gigawatts, mostly lead acid. And think about that. I mean, that's a fleet of assets that's just laying around waiting for a power quality event. Hmm, remember that thing about multiple benefit streams? <laughs> Maybe there's a way we can convert that fleet into doing something more than just a reliability once in a while thing. But bottom line is, there is a lot of storage. Most of it's pumped hydro. That's been used for a long, long time. But more recently, there is what we're calling this non-pumped hydro or advanced energy storage slice that is growing and growing, and uh, that is the subject that I want to now turn to. So, getting back to the question of why. I think to answer this question why, we need to start looking at how the electric power sector is governed. And one curious thing about the electric power sector is, you know, it's been around for a very, very long time, and it's governed in silos the familiar generation, transmission, distribution, and load. Within each of these silos, the rules are formed, and decisions in these silos determine how resources are compensated. Now, when you take a step back and you look at that, you say, wow, you know, that's, that's kind of cool. And there's all these jurisdictions. There's FERC and the different state-level policies. I don't want to go into that. <laughs> But at the simplest level, there's these four silos. And the question is, where does storage fit? 
And it, you know, that, you know, it's sort of a rhetorical question. And, you know, and when you think about it, it's the asset class's greatest asset, its greatest strength, but it is also its greatest liability because we're flexible, Storage can serve as generation. It can be transmission. It can be distribution. It can even be load. Remember how it can provide a sink for that duck belly? Well, the problem is it does fit everywhere. And because it fits everywhere, it doesn't have a home. And within each of these silos, you know, there's proceedings, there's activities underway, and everybody agrees that storage could be an interesting thing, but it's not in their top 50 things that they look at. So what you focus on is what you get. And until we started CISA in January of 2009, there was no organized regulatory activity for energy storage on the grid anywhere in the planet. 2009, think about that. So my point is regulatory intervention is necessary to allow fair compensation mechanisms for storage as a new asset class in the electric power system. Fortunately, grassroots change is underway. We started CISA in January of 2009, and since then, a number of new uh, regional storage advocacy groups have been formed, the most recent which is Ontario Energy Storage Alliance. They don't even have a logo yet, but they're going strong. We have, first it was CISA, then TISA for Texas, then CINISA, China, um, after China, then we had a European association, and then the Electricity Storage Association started a national effort to focus on federal issues. Germany was for India, and then Germany were formed soon thereafter. So this is this kind of change, this grassroots change is underway, and um, you know there's talk of another one starting in Hawaii. Um, yesterday, I was talking to somebody about doing one in Japan. This is a movement that's happening all over the world, and this is the start of the change. It happens when people like me or you get interested, get involved, and start making a difference. For CISA, um, we started this in January of 2009. It was actually at the suggestion of the Public Utilities Commission. Um, we were involved in some regulatory activity on behalf of some of our storage clients, and. Somebody at the PUC asked Don Liddell, my co-founder and I, if we would consider starting an advocacy group for storage because you know, it was getting kind of relevant and interesting in a number of areas, and they didn't want to talk to 50 different companies. So we started CISA in 2009 with one member company, and we're now, as Ron said, up to close to 60. <coughs> CISA represents every form of grid storage here in California all the different subclasses. Um, but what's interesting is our membership also includes some very, very successful renewable energy developers, firms like, um, let's see here, NextEra, where are they? Well, can't find them here, but NextEra Energy, Res Americas, very large wind and solar developers, electrical contractors. What we're trying to do, our mission is to make energy storage a mainstream resource to accelerate the adoption of renewable energy and create a more affordable, cleaner, and reliable electric power system in California. And we're building the coalition and the ecosystem to make that happen. So um, I'm going to go through in the next series of slides just a quick overview of what's happening on the policy front that's enabling this change. Of course, Innovation and technology is always welcome, but the hypothesis and one of the takeaways that I hope all of you will walk out of here um, taking with you today is that the problem with energy storage is not one of technology. We have a lot of technologies that are commercially viable and being deployed today. The problem is really more of a market design. It's a regulatory problem. And the good news is that's something that we can do something about, and we don't need some huge new invention to make it happen. So the first thing that happened that's pretty significant is an order that came from FERC, I believe in 2010, FERC Order 755, where FERC took a look at that chart I was showing you before for the frequency regulation, and they said, wow, you know, all the balancing authorities all over the country have tariffs. 
and tariffs compensate resources for providing frequency regulation. But the way the tariff is structured, it assumes that everyone's a fossil generator. It assumes you're super slow. And so what FERC said is, this kind of compensation mechanism we've done since the dawn of time is discriminatory because if you're faster and you're better, you're not getting paid for your performance. So they issued FERC Order 755. It's called Pay for Performance, where FERC required the system operators under their jurisdiction to come up with a new tariff that rewards fast performance. And that has been fully implemented in PJM. That's an independent system operator in the Northeast, one of the largest. It will soon be implemented in CAISO. But this is, a da this is data that shows you the impact of how regulation makes a difference. FERC order implemented October 1, 2012. This is the pricing. The dark bar is the 2011 pricing. This is dollars per megawatt hour that's paid in the PJM market. Between um, September to October, the, um, the average monthly regu regulation price um, you know, went up two and a half times. Stayed high, kind of stabilized. Meanwhile, during the same time period, these are the active storage projects. When you, when you participate in these markets, you have to file for interconnection. Those are the storage projects that are in the queue. So you can see that this one change had a dramatic impact in that market. No new technology was invented between 2010 and 2011. It was a market change that made that happen. So I said it's happening soon for CAISO. So PGM went live in 2012, Midwest ISO soon thereafter. California independent system operators expected next month in June. Uh, New York ISO similarly, and then finally New England in 2015. So these changes all across the country are creating an attractive value proposition for fast storage projects all over the country. Another key development, you may have heard of um, Assembly Bill 2514. I know this is kind of a text-heavy slide. This bill is really big, folks, for a number of reasons. One, this bill was sponsored by Jerry Brown when he was Attorney General. This was the first piece of legislation that Jerry Brown sponsored in probably two decades, maybe since the last time he was governor. Jerry then ran for office. We, know, we all know how that turned out. And um, the bill authored by Assembly Member Nancy Skinner, we are in her district, was signed into law by Governor Schwarzenegger. So it's, you know, it was truly kind of, when you think about it, a bipartisan thing. And what this bill does is it requires the Public Utilities Commission to open a rulemaking, a proceeding, to specifically focus on energy storage and look at all the ways that storage can be deployed in California's electric power system. And if found to be commercially viable and cost effective to establish procurement targets for load serving entities by October of 2013. And those procurement targets should be for 2015 and 2020 and for the publicly owned utilities that would be 2016 and 2021. So it was a pretty massive, all-encompassing bill, squarely focused on storage, the first of its kind anywhere in the world. Um, we had the privilege of supporting and helping the Attorney General during this time to see this bill successfully enacted. And now we're um, deeply engaged with multiple stakeholders at the Public Utilities Commission, all the utilities and other interested stakeholders in a successful outcome with this bill. What this bill does, is it gives us that focus we need on storage. You know, storage, when it used to be priority number 49 in the smart grid rulemaking, now has a home where it's priority number one. And we're making great progress. So one of the things I'd like to share with you um, from the massive body of work that's coming out of the implementation of this bill is preliminary results on cost effectiveness. Remember earlier we talked about how storage has this amazing ability to perform multiple services from the same assets? Well, the first application we looked at, and I say we, meaning CISA, PUC, and the utilities in close coordination with EPRI, was this application called peaker substitution, or a bulk application. How do we use peaker, and how do we use storage in lieu of that peaker that we looked at before? And 
after weeks and weeks of discovering and discussing and debating the assumptions, the results came out, surprise, surprise, in virtually all of the cases, all of the scenarios analyzed, the benefit to cost ratio for energy storage as compared to the gas peaker in this application was greater than one. The peaker, by the way, its base case was a 0.85. That means, translated, in virtually all the scenarios for this preliminary analysis, storage is more cost effective than what we do today as our status quo, knee jerk, this is what we do day in, day out. This, I would argue, is huge. Nowhere on the planet has this happened where we had a systematic approach to looking at how storage is used, what the benefits are, and how it compares to a fossil fuel alternative. And that with this first look, we are finding that storage is more cost effective. So this work being done today, though it's California focused, will have reverberations and impacts throughout the world, anywhere we have a developed grid. Oh, and the important thing to mention is this analysis didn't even factor in the GHG benefits. So if anything, it's conservative. I think in part because of the exciting findings coming out of this, uh, Commissioner Peterman, who's um, the PUC commissioner in charge of this rulemaking, has announced that within soon, within the coming weeks, she will be issuing a proposal on procurement targets pursuant to this bill. So stay tuned for that. It'll be interesting to see what happens next. Another interesting thing that's happened recently, um, we in California have this other rulemaking called long-term procurement planning. And this is the process, this is the proceeding whereby the state, in partnership with the utilities, figure out how much capacity and energy is needed over the next 10 years. And in the recent decision under phase one, where they were looking at Southern California, the Public Utilities Commission, Commissioner Florio, who's in charge of this proceeding, came out with a decision, a final decision, might I add, that requires Southern California Edison to procure at least 50 megawatts of energy storage in the LA basin for local capacity and reliability. What's exciting is the, that same decision says they, they must procure an additional, up to an additional 600 megawatts of capacity from preferred resources. Now, preferred resources have been defined by our loading order, and um, probably many of you are familiar with that. That loading order was created from a multi-agency, CEC, PUC, CAISO, Governor's Office loading order at the time CISA didn't exist, storage wasn't on the landscape, so storage isn't in the loading order. So because the definition of preferred resources at that time did not include energy storage, the decision went on to say the 600 megawatts has to be preferred resource, including energy storage. That is significant. So um, our view on the loading order is that um, you know it is what it is, but when you think about it, storage should be at every place of the loading order. Storage can be used in conjunction with distributed generation, with renewable energy, with demand response. So everywhere that different resources show up in that preference, in that loading order preference, when storage is used for that purpose, it should be in there too. And this decision enforces that. Finally, Governor Brown, um, some of you may have heard, has an executive order out there seeking to accomplish 1.5 million EVs by 2025. So 1 million by 2020 and 1.5 million by 2025. Um, I've been told by utility colleagues, folks smarter, much smarter than me, that each EV, you know, when plugged in, can represent as much as the load of an additional house. And when you plug in that many new electric consuming vehicles, you can imagine there's some challenges associated with that. When you charge, how you charge, how quickly you charge. Energy storage, stationary energy storage, of course there's energy storage in the cars, but stationary energy storage can be used to help mitigate and manage some of the impacts of all those new EVs plugging into the grid. So. 
that's my um, recap about what's happening on the policy front, which, as we said before, is the barrier to more adoption. And now I want to get to my most favorite part of my presentation, which is, what does this mean for all of you? Where are the opportunities? So what does the future look like? Energy storage is transforming our electric power system. What you're seeing here is a, um, a screenshot of the DOE International Energy Storage Database. It's a new, freely accessible public database of energy storage projects deployed around the world. Currently, it has approximately two, 200 systems in there. It's gaining steam, and you can see they're all over the globe. Um, we've been working on this project in partnership with Sandia and Department of Energy for the last year or so. So I encourage all of you to go check it out. You can find projects. You can look at them by technology, by application. You can see pictures of them. This database also has a companion part which itemizes policies that are in effect in the United States. So... Um, not only is this happening as a trend around the world, but um, this is energy storage is not only impacting the electric power system, this is an interesting time in history. Doesn't happen too often where you have one asset class that's at the epicenter of massive change affecting many, many industries. Titans, and it's in the middle. You know, we're talking about the grid. We're talking about change off-grid. I mean, this was mostly a developed country-centric presentation, but we could have a similar one-hour presentation, just how energy storage is enabling the elect rural electrification. Consumer electronics. I mean, where would we be without batteries? Your cell phone, your iPads, your computers. Transportation, and now that the transportation sector is getting electrified. Renewable energy, demand-side management. Energy storage is in the middle. And when you see such tectonic changes happening in so many very big industries, it's not too much of a leap to realize that there's going to be huge opportunity, huge opportunity for all of you startup entrepreneur types and students. I hope you will consider this. So um, the first opportunity clearly is in what is an energy storage system. How does an energy storage system get delivered onto the grid? And there's several components. You know, on the equipment side, there's the storage device itself. There's power electronics, controls. You've got to package it. There's some grid periphery, transformers, and other equipment to plug it in. There's another piece of an energy storage system, which is what we call controls and profit optimization. So this is the brains. How do you operate it? Do you discharge now or do you discharge later? What information do you take in to make smart decisions? There are so many cool startups that are emerging just on that alone. And as you can imagine, interesting new business models to go along with it. And finally, there's plenty of services, project development, sales, financing, engineering, procurement, construction. Our prediction is that traditional renewable energy industries, solar, wind, are now going to turn their attention not only from doing renewable energy, but all those skills that are necessary in renewable energy can now be applied to an addition, energy storage, as part of the offering that they provide. And then finally, there's tremendous opportunities in grid deployment and system-wide integration. So we can look at a storage system in isolation or its role in the grid overall. And there, I would say there's huge opportunity in policy. You know, folks, if you're interested, come on down the street. We'd love to um, get some helpers because there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Lots of policy development when you think about all those applications that storage touches. Grid integration from a utility standpoint. You know, what are the physical interconnection and protection protocols when you're putting an asset on the grid that can charge and discharge? Power system modeling, what, what is going to be the impact to the system distribution and transmission systems from having this kind of resource available, especially one that's controllable? We just don't know. And finally, you know, what are the communication and control systems and protocols that are needed to manage this amazing new asset class, this new capability? 
What are the contractual obligations, the security obligations? What are those algorithms that we need at a system level to really optimize these different resources? So regardless of your background, whether you're coming from economics, engineering, um, system, whatever, there's something here for everybody. And finally, you know, in our short time together, you know, we can only maybe touch the surface. This is such a rich, dynamic, and, and very complicated field. So if you'd like to learn more, come to Energy Storage North America. This is going to be the first conference and expo held here in San Jose this September to focus exclusively on how energy storage can be applied to the grid, cross transmission, distribution, and the electrification of transportation. What are the applications? What are the business models? Who are the movers and shakers that are going to make this happen? So um, there's more information at ESNA Expo. I also brought some flyers in the back. If you want to grab one of those. And we've already lined up a, a great um, section of speakers and sponsors and supporting partners. So it should be a great event, and it's so close to home. So finally, um, in summary, just want to recap what some of our key takeaways are today. One, energy storage is not a new technology class. Yes, there is a tremendous amount of innovation happening today, some right up the street here at Cal, but it is not new. And there's technologies that are available to be commercially deployed right now and are being deployed around the world. It has the potential to optimize our electric power system save money for ratepayers, reduce greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions, and help facilitate the integration of more and more renewable energy. You know what? When we can do that, that's going to help with, you know, global security. And really, the key barrier to achieving these benefits of energy storage is our regulatory framework. It's the ability or our current inability to monetize all of these wonderful benefits that storage provides. So we need your help. Regulatory intervention is the way to go and to have a lot of near-term impact. So I challenge all of you, remember policy matters, learn the issues, get involved, and change the world. Thank you. I realize that we've gone a little bit over time, um, so if those of you that need to leave, uh, please feel, feel, to do, feel free to do so. Janice is available to uh, answer questions, so for those of you who have questions. Thank you so much. Okay, go ahead. Oh. The first Hi. Yes. Uh, I had a question about your cost effectiveness studies that you showed for sure. the storage versus the peaking plants. Mm -hmm. Is that in light of the new regulatory changes in the pay, pay for performance, or was that before that? They modeled a couple of cases. So they modeled um, no pay for performance and with pay for performance. And pay for performance does make a big difference, though it's not required in all of the cases. I guess my question is, uh, you know, conventional wisdom dictates that they will, if there's a cheaper way to do it, that they will find a way. So why, why aren't they implementing storage if it is cheaper than the, the peaking plants? Oh, yes. So, um, so there's, boy, that's a multifaceted answer. Okay. Okay, so take um, frequency regulation, for example. Until about a year ago, it wasn't even possible for storage to talk to KISO, Cal the California Independent System Operator's software, because it wasn't, their software wasn't set up to deal with a resource that could charge and discharge. So we needed to intervene, and KISO implemented something called regulation energy management. They had to change their software so an asset that has this charge-discharge capability could even talk to it. That's an example of a fundamental change that needed to happen before you could even participate. Secondly, um, on the procurement, like through the PUC, how uh, energy and capacity is procured today is typically through the LTPP process and the utilities each have their own procurement process. They call it an RFO, a request for offer. One of the things we did as part of the LTPP proceeding at the PUC was we took one as an example and went through it. And if you read through the RFP, 
no storage developer in their right mind would ever even bid because it's, cl it's clearly, it, there is no clear pathway to having a different type of resource provide a bid. It's so squarely meant for fossil resources. So what we are dealing with is changing status quo. We're changing behavior. We're changing software. We're changing procurement methodologies. We're changing, um, you know, pretty much everything. So these are the things that need to happen. And that cost effectiveness looked at the system benefits that storage device can provide. Um, and, it, and it tried to stick to the ones that are monetized today. You'll notice there was a benefit not even on there called capacity. There is a capacity value. It wasn't even on there because we don't have a capacity market for storage. So I hope that answered your question. Hi. Um, I'd like to first agree with you that energy storage is definitely the game changer, and it brings about tremendous value to energy producers, uh, consumers, and the society overall. If it can be done cheaply and easily, um, because I think it basically addresses the fundament, the, the physical and economic fundamentals of many of the um, energy commodities, that they are either impossible or very difficult or very expensive to store, or um, and they are um, they have inelastic demand, so it has a really high price volatility. So uh, I guess my question is that um, since the energy industry has been um, evolving around this fact that um, and many energy com commodities such as electricity are hard to um, transport tran or transmit or store, um, given your business background, what would, what would you envision that the energy market would have to um, kind of restructure to make energy storage a reality, like easily implementable? So, um, so one of the challenges is every energy market is different. We have a different market here than in the Northeast. It's different in China and India. That is a challenge. It's complicated. Um, for, uh, as an example, we were just talking about capacity value for storage. There's really no way now for storage to, to earn revenue for its capacity value in the system. Some of the ways, and this requires grassroots intervention um, through resource adequacy and long-term procurement planning, we have been advocating that not only can storage participate in this, but that some of the requirements be changed. Like historically in California, for resource adequacy, um, it was a minimum of a four-hour duration. You know, it's a four-hour window, and it's only a year ahead. It's a contract a year ahead. If you're trying to develop an asset that's, a, you know, very capital intensive, and you're trying to raise money to finance that asset, and you can just get a contract for one year, chances are you're probably not going to secure that financing. So not only do we need storage to be able to participate in you know, the uh, RA product, the product probably shouldn't be just limited to four hours. I mean, storage can provide capacity at any increment. And three, we need more than a year contract. We need multi-years. How about like a 10-year contract? These are the things that will enable commercial adoption of storage. Another way to go with capacity is just to create a capacity market. And there's talk of doing that, say, here in California. It exists elsewhere. But the bottom line is we need to develop market structures where you can, um, developers and investors can secure a bankable cash flow for their investment in this asset. That's the name of the game. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, when, when will private customers be able to trade energy just like stocks? Like when will the technology be ready and, and you know, everything that is required? Well, um, you know, that, that's actually possible today. You know, there are free competitive wholesale markets um, not necessarily down to the consumer level, but there is talk of that where, you know, individuals can maybe sell energy. Um, I would say, I would put the question back to you as a student here dreaming up what the future could look like, um, you know. But it's an interesting idea. And maybe another way to 
um, achieve the same result and, and, and in some ways distributed generation is enabling this, right? Because as a consumer, what are your choices today? You buy electricity from your local utility. In certain markets, you have a choice of utilities. Here in California, we do not. Um, another alternative is potentially generate your own power. Another alternative is generate your own power with energy storage. So now you can add a, a, an additional dimension of reliability. So there are choices, and I, I do believe that as that, you know, as we make progress, that it will fundamentally change the competitive landscape for how people, where and how they procure their energy and energy reliability needs. So you have mentioned the electric vehicles as a huge load for the future power grid. So do you have any vision to make it also a resources as an energy storage in the future? Because sometimes electric vehicles can feed power back to the grid. Oh, yes. Um, so they call that, um, is your question about V2G? Can these electric vehicles provide services to the grid? Um, in fact, there's some very successful demonstrations for that happening right now. Um, I believe there's one with NRG and EV Grid and the University of Delaware where electric vehicles are actually providing frequency regulation services into the PJM marketplace and getting paid. Um, there's, uh, I believe, at least one or two other demos of that here in California. I think the fundamental challenge with that is overcoming the battery warranty for the car. But I can tell you, you know, as the car industry and the OEMs become more involved in the electric power sector, who knows what could happen? I mean, right now there's this range anxiety issue and making sure the battery works, but this is an example where we may see tectonic shifts, you know? Like, could it be that a car manufacturer is gonna come in because they're, they're, they're gonna be in touch with their energy storage system in that car? Could it be possible that a car manufacturer could retain ownership of that battery use it for other services, interact with you as a consumer to let you use that for transportation, but maybe you, when that battery is not being used to power your car, use it for other things. I can see how that could happen. Absolutely. We're gonna cover that in Energy Storage North America. Any, any final questions? Maybe one more? Okay, let's give Janice okay. a final Thank applause. You. Thank you.